Welcome to the Rising Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we feature top founders and entrepreneurs and their journey. Now, let's get started with the show. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder and host of InspiredInsider.com and the co-host of Rising Entrepreneurs Podcast, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And this is going to be a great episode with Wendy Peace and Carrie Garvis. Before I formally introduce them, you know, Wendy and Carrie, I like to mention other episodes people should check out of the podcast. And um, Andrea Houston, founder of R2's Design, who's actually in EO and... Uh, also um, in Seattle, uh, so uh, Women of EO. I think they have an event actually coming up soon. Women of EO and Andrea Herrera of Box Experience, in who's in Chicago, uh, also had on the podcast. Who is a women woman of EO as well? And Vern Harnish has been on the podcast. That was a great episode. And my business partner John featured Kerry Santos. Uh, as well on the Rising Entrepreneur. So check those out. And this episode is brought to you by Rise 25. And at Rise 25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. We're an easy button for people to launch and run their podcast. You know, for me, you know, Wendy Carey, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And over the past decade of podcasting, I've found no better way than to profile the people and the companies I admire and respect and feature them in their stories on the show. So if you are a business out there and you've thought about podcasting, you should, hands down. If you have questions, you can go to rise25.com and email us. We've been doing it for over a decade at this point, and we, I'm sure we could hopefully pretty much answer any question that you have. I am super excited. We have the CEO and founder of Ovation, uh, Kerry Garbus, who's trained thousands of business professionals from companies such as Walt Disney, MasterCard, Verizon. And she does this. She helps them with presentation skills, storytelling, etiquette, emotional intelligence. She actually wrote a book, Presentation Skills for Managers. It's been published by McGraw-Hill. You can check her out at getovation.com. And she's got some great stories, some great tips for us today. We have Wendy Peace. He's the president and owner of Rapport International, a translation and interpretation services company specializing in marketing translation. Um, and, you know, I, I listened to her book. She's the author of The Language of Global Marketing. And um, you can learn more at rapporttranslations.com. And they really opened my eyes to, you know, oftentimes I only think of the U.S., so when I read her book, it just it just opened us. There's so much more outside of this from a cultural and business perspective. So I encourage people to check out her book. So thank you both for joining me. You're welcome. Yeah, I'm honored to be with Carrie. And you've had some incredible other EO women on. So it's nice to hear. I'll have to go back and listen to them. I didn't realize. Yes, those four yeah. guests you've mentioned, I've <laughs> met two of them and spoken to all three. The it, except for the last, except for who was it, John Santos? Is that who oh, said? Carrie Santos? Carrie Santos, sorry. Mm -hmm. And yeah, how could I forget that this was, their name was Carrie? But because I feel like I'm the only one. The Andrea, Andrea, and Vern, <laughs> all amazing. Yeah. Love it. I want to start off, you know, Carrie, with you and just talk to people about what Get Ovation does and what you do. Sure. So the, it's truly Ovation. I just have a, the catchy URL of getovation.com. I love the URL. And thank you. And we're communication skills training. So anything under the umbrella of professional presence and speaker development. So we're working, we're partnering with HR and L&D departments on the corporate side, coming in to help with anything from presentation skills to storytelling to overall communication within teams. And then on the event side, the speaker development side, which is a lot of fun and kind of my favorite, don't tell the L&D and HR people, that we'll get uh, hundreds, thousands of speakers ready a year to present at their conferences. Yeah. And so we're going to dig deep on that because especially in this virtual world, people are probably presenting maybe more often they would in the physical world. So now we're getting back to physical and virtual. And this is applies to if you're on a podcast, if you're doing a presentation, or if you're doing a webinar. So we're going to dig deep on that. And um, Wendy, talk to people about you and what you do. Sure. Well, 
we take it beyond just presenting in one language. So Carrie gets them all lined up with the content they need to do, and then we take it and take it across multiple languages. So we do everything from highly technical written translations like patents um, or, you know, market entry research and contracts up to, you know, website translation, brochures, user manuals, anything that has to be in the written form, but we don't stop there. We also help people when they're speaking. So uh, it can be anything from the telephone, a webinar meeting, uh, uh, um, the live interpreter that's going to come with you to a meeting, like a doctor's appointment or a deposition or a voc rehab, um, uh, up to conference interpreting. So, Carrie, I don't. We should talk because we'll work with speakers and and help them present when they're going to be presenting through an interpreter. I don't know if you do that training, but that's uh, certainly something that's becoming more and more important because there are certain words that you shouldn't use and. Humor is a particular consideration, how fast you speak, you know, having your slides translated or advanced materials given over to the interpreters. Yeah. So we we do everything to another language. I'm yes, gonna, abs absolutely. I'm going to talk about that because in your book, you talk about some funny translations like that would if you just try and go to Google Translate, it would technically be correct but it's offensive. So we'll talk about maybe some of the offensive translations people use or they name their company the wrong thing. And it, it basically, you know, in that language, it's actually offensive. But, um, you know, I want to start off and we'll, we'll dig deep on a few topics here, but with a couple fun facts about each of you. And um, Wendy, we'll start with you. Um, you know, these are the ones I don't know that you're going to throw know. at yeah, me. You yeah. do not know what I'm going to say here, <laughs> but, um, you know, I do a lot of research ahead of time. But, you know, as a young child, you lived in a lot of different places, Mexico, Taiwan, Philippines, you lived uh, where there was no electricity or running water in a town. So um, I'd love for you to just talk about one of those experiences and how it shaped you uh, living internationally. Sure, yeah, I can talk about um, Taiwan as you, you listen to the book. Uh, which I recorded in my basement wine cooler, or wine storage room that I use for uh, gift storage. Um, that was a load of fun with a, an expert recording person. But in there, um, I talk about living in Taiwan. My dad was in international agriculture research. And so he, we were assigned to go live in a new center that was just being developed outside of Shenhua, Taiwan. And that was the small town that didn't have running water or electricity, but the center with, that they were building, it did. But we'd go into the town and they had never seen blonde haired children. Um, so my brothers and I would show up and people there would wanna touch, touch our skin, touch our hair. Um, and you know, we could buy all the fresh, produce and um, meat was still a scarcity, but cereal you couldn't get except for driving about an hour, an hour and a half to Tainan and you go into this little black market store. And so to this day, I still love the cereal. <laughs> I, I had it for dinner last night. My, uh, my son happened to be out and I was like, oh, I'm just going to have cereal. So, you know, there's a lot of funky little things that can form when you're a child. I think it also gave me a love of uh, cross-cultural communications. You know, how do you communicate when you don't share a language? What can you do with body language, the appreciation that you can get and in, um, in talking to people that when you don't share a language and how you can come together and share experiences. Yeah. One of my favorite desserts is Lucky Charms. So sometimes after dinner, I'll use cereal as a dessert. So um, it says there's vitamins in there. I don't know how healthy it, it is. It seems but... healthier than cake and cookies and ice cream, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, you know, for you, uh, Carrie, I have two fun facts. Um, one is that that Annie was an inspiration for your career trajectory. So talk about that. And if you are um, inclined, um, one of my favorite songs is Hard Knock Life. So, but start with Annie. How is that influential for you? Well, I was six years old and I grew up in Baltimore and my parents took me to the first national tour of Annie. And I was already taking dance and playing piano and, and like to sing. But after the show, we go out to dinner 
and happened to sit next to all the little girls that were in the show. And this was like, <gasps> to me, I mean, this was every star, the mega amazement to my little six-year-old self. And I ended up in a conversation with the six, the, the other six-year-old who was in the cast. It was the youngest girl and she was playing Molly in the show. And I was like, what's it like to be a professional actress? And what do you do? And she was like, oh, it's great. And you have a tutor and you go shopping during the day and you do a <laughs> show at night. And I was like, this is great. And that I turned to my parents at that dinner and I said, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Um, my mother may have cried a little, uh, and and I, happiness, right? Right. And for years and years, I held on to that program uh, until it disintegrated, just withered with time. And the the girl who played Molly in that production was Alyssa Milano. Wow. That's crazy. Yes. So thanks, wait, Alyssa. Wait, wait. I, I but I hear you sing. I want to hear you sing Hard Knock Life. I do, I do sing. I do love Annie. So with apologies to all the Annie fans, it's a hard knock life for us. It's a hard knock life for us. Static treated, we get kicked. Static kisses, we get tricked. It's a hard knock life. And I just messed up the words, but that's fine. Amazing. I love it. One of my favorites. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna have to replay that one, Gary. Thank you. Oh. Um, so I wasn't really, I wasn't really warmed up. I mean, I put you on the spot, you know. Um, <laughs> so Wendy, I'll come to you in a second, but but Gary, you know, your teachings and and your company comes out of your experience from you know acting and singing and everything that you do. Um, talk about the right now um, in person, yes. in person return and events training what's going on well it is like all of a sudden the world woke up and said oh right we want to get back together and the wonderful staff of facilitators and coaches i have which are by the way all professional actors that is the whole inspiration for the company because i think actors have important things to say to business professionals um it is uh, wonderful and exciting and what has come to light it, it just in the past couple months is that now we're getting people back together which is great which is really what we love we also you know virtual all good back together human interaction that's where it's at and here's the thing if you have a group of people coming back together for the first time who haven't seen each other in two years or maybe they haven't met yet and have only worked virtually all they want to do is talk to each other they don't actually want to do communication skills exercises they really want to just talk to each other so we have been working with curriculum development and kind of reframing opportunities for people to connect and and talk to each other and uh, putting a little uh, education in there too so giving giving time people to breathe hug connect all that good stuff um you know both of you mentioned before we hit record about building a sales engine. And so that's top of mind. And so, Wendy, I want to start with you. And what are your thoughts? You know, there's a lot of business owners listening to this on building a sales engine. Well, <laughs> that's what I'm struggling with. I don't know if I have anything to say to business owners about how to do it. But yeah, where I've gotten to in my business is we've, we've built over networking and referrals. and um, if I think about bringing in a sales team to do that, it's harder to network these days. Um, and that's not how a lot of sales is doing. There's so much more automation at the top of the funnel and it's so much more electronic networking. So how do you build out that top of funnel to be efficient um, using technology and maybe BDRs and maybe VAs from international so that you're driving more leads into, uh, you know, actual buying opportunities. And we do a ton of inbound uh, marketing, and that's been successful to a certain point. But I think you have to have inbound and outbound. Um, 
And so that's what we're, you, you know, we focused on, on inbound. I've got uh, Lisa Ray, who's running that. She's absolutely fantastic. Now, how do we supplement that with the outbound function? Yeah, I mean, for me, Wendy, I always have more questions than answers. So I, sometimes the questions are more valuable than anything else. So I want to hear your thought press and how you're thinking this through, because I think for any business, this is always top of mind, you know, whether I don't know if any business has it figured it has figured it out. I mean, you've been doing this for for uh, 17 over decade, years, you know? Yeah, yeah exactly. So um, I'm curious. And then Carrie, I want to hear your thoughts on it. But uh, what software do you like to use just in general with your company? Because you mentioned automation. Are there certain softwares that you use as a company that you like? You know, um, like we use like LastPass and ActiveCampaign. There's like a lot of different ones we like. What do you what do you like to use? I just started using LastPass and now I'm I'm converted. I think it's Game fantastic. Changing. Yeah, yeah. To change your passwords and easily log in and share passwords with other people that have to get in. Um, yeah, so we're we're extreme HubSpot fans. So we've been using that for years. Um, at this point, couldn't live without it. Um, I shouldn't say that they may double our price, but <laughs> I really do like HubSpot. Um, LinkedIn, LinkedIn Navigator, uh, we do a lot with that. We fooled around with um, Duck Soup on how to do some automated outreach. Um, but, you know, then it's trying to figure out how to make the connections because you can't just make connections and drop it. You've got to build the relationship. But Duck Soup has been able to help with that. We use Phantom Buster to take names that we names and companies that we don't have uh, information on to try to get their name in a direct email contact. We've been trying some automated email outreach, but that hasn't worked real well. Um, but we're 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 still in the testing phase, and we're using Persist IQ for that. Um, let me see. LinkedIn Navigator has been very interesting to help us uh, develop lists. Um, so I think those are the, okay. the key ones that we're using. Yeah. So Kerry, we'll go to your favorite software. So uh, yeah, we use LastPass, Active Campaign. Another one that I like to tell people about is is Text Expander. Um, it's the best three dollars you could spend a month. Um, so check it out. It's like a desktop app where if you type in a word, if you find yourself typing the same thing over and over, like here's my bio or here's an answer to this, you can actually save all those in Text Expander. And when you type in that that word, it will pop up in your email or in social media. So uh, we love that. Yeah, we use text blaze, which is the same thing. But I think that's that's yeah. free for so many things mm -hmm. that you put in. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, so Carrie, what about you? What are some of your favorite softwares that you use? And I'd love to hear, you know, how you think about the sales pipeline and sales in general. Sure. Absolutely. Last pass. Yes. Huge proponent. HubSpot, love it. Slack for internal communication. We tried to move all team communication to HubSpot, uh, Slack rather, so that email doesn't get, that can get so, I can get buried under that pretty quickly. Uh, Proposify for our proposals, um, which link, all of this links in nicely to HubSpot, which I really, really like. Basecamp for project management. And then personally for my writing, because I'm a terrible speller, is uh, I use an app called Grammarly. Mm, and Grammarly. I do, yeah, right? Say, I don't know, for me, it saves my life. So I'm going to check out Text Expander, though. That sounds really interesting. Check it out. Um, yeah. In terms of the cash flow sales, for us, the, the challenge is it's really, as a friend of mine, uh, a finance guy said it's really chunky, right? Because it'll come in and then and and goes down. And the challenges because we're working with so many very large players that the the payment cycle can be net sixty five, net ninety. And so we've done a ton of work. I've paid the the staff. We've put out the expenses, and I'm waiting two plus months to get the cash back in. So sometimes that can get a uh, very, a little, you know, nerve wracking. And what I've, so what I just try to do is jam in as many sales as possible. Like I'm just a fiend for, yes, 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 yes. We can do it. We can do it. Um, and bring in as many sales as possible. And luckily a lot of the work that I've done over the past 10 years of having a business is building up the processes to support that so that as much work as we're taking on, 
its rolling out and delivery of it is successful versus uh, having complaints or it's not up to snuff for our clients. Yeah. I'd love to hear in if you have any, Wendy, chime in to have tips on for collection purposes. I remember, I forgot what guest it was, but they said they would send a gift to whoever the person at the payment thing is like, they send them a bottle of wine like every month, just as a nice thing. And they make sure they're paid on time. Um, I don't know if there's <laughs> any tips you have, maybe keeping track in one of the CRMs to make sure that everything's paid on time, or maybe it's just all set up and you have no problems with that. Well, anybody can send me a bottle line anytime and I'll absolutely pay them. Yeah, sure. <laughs> exactly. absolutely. I don't, I don't think that would, that I love that idea. That would not work for if I'm sending a bottle of wine for somebody in AP and like some gigantic company, I might think it might be perceived as a bribe. So uh, not for me. I would say, you know, we have, I have um, a, an outsourced controller bookkeeper. Uh, they're sending the invoices right now. Whoever has the relationship, the salesperson, me will then do the, the follow-up and it, you know, it's a pain. Yeah. I feel sometimes, like stuff sometimes can, it's a pain. I ask because I feel like stuff can get lost, right? You send it, yeah. it's a big corporate, you know, so it just needs to be at least kept track of and then followed up on at a minimum, yes. you know? So you'll, you'll have someone kind of who owns it, who will follow up with it and they keep it on their, their list and they're just there to follow up with it until it comes through. Yeah. So we keep, I mean, I keep track of that through the aging report our QuickBooks aging report. That's Got that's it. how I, I see it. And I'm like, oh, no, we got to reach out to the, that person. Got it. Um, so I want to go through. So Wendy, I don't know if you have anything to chime in on, on the collections part or just following up. If there's any specific oh. process people should think about um, on that end. I think like Carrie said, is you got to put a process in around it. So we outsource our bookkeeping to analytics, which is based in Massachusetts, but everything's done over in India. So when an invoice goes out, we've got a follow-up that goes out on certain peri time periods for, for when it's due. If it gets past a certain time, then we have somebody internal um, call and, and figure out what's going on. Um, the other thing that we do for larger jobs, we take 50% payment up front because then that enables us to cover our expenses, you know, if we have a collection issue. So um, not, you know, not, it doesn't cover all of our expenses, but it covers a good amount. So we're not struggling with that, the, you know, the up and down cash flow so much on the bigger projects. Um, and so that, that's, that's been pretty good. I think over the history of the company, we've had collections issues with two big companies that, you know, have, have drug out and, and, uh, caused us a problem. Of course, we've had, you know, small ones here and there where, you know, it's just a thorn in your side because it's taking more time. But right. for the most part, we, once we got the process set up, we stayed on top of it and, and it works. Yeah, I asked because, I mean, even if you look at, you know, we're at Hunter's book, Scaling Up, and one of the major sections is cash flow, right? So yeah. it, this is a real deal problem um, or can be for businesses. Um, so, Carrie, another fun fact, because um, I forgot to mention when we were talking about fun facts, is I don't know if Wendy knows this one. This is a really cool one. You actually went to school with Tupac and Jada, Jada Pinkett Smith. I did. Wendy, did yes. you know that? No, I didn't know. She continues to amaze so, me. I got <laughs> just again, there was whenever someone's listening to this, there was a thing that happened at the Oscars. So that Jada Pinkett Smith has been in the news, but what were they like in high school? Okay, first of all, can I talk about the Oscars just for a second? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> there was a not, okay, so Jada uh, is one of my, so I went to the Baltimore School for the Arts. Jada is one of the most famous alumni we have. And however, there was also another Baltimore School graduate was the conductor at the Oscars. And I feel that Dante Winslow's a debut as the conductor, Baltimore, proud Baltimore School of the Arts graduate. It was so overshadowed by what happened with Jada. And the cool thing was that before the Oscars, that Dante and Jada were posting all these pictures of like, yo, School of the Arts in the house pictures. And they were really cool and everybody was so proud. And, um, and I just wanted to give a shout out to Dante. And uh, so 
so in so high Dante, school, yes. was, was he in the same class also, or was just he was a couple, just a couple years younger okay. than me in yeah. the music department. I was in both music and theater, so uh, it's it's really really exciting. And uh, I mean, and just to say something, you know, Carrie is a small school. It's not like there were thousands of people there, right? So oh, oh no, my graduating class uh, included me and Jada, and there were fifty five people in our graduating class. Um, this, what I do like to throw down is this, you know, the senior superlatives, like people vote, like most likely to whatever, uh, Jada and I tied for most popular girl. So there's that. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> um, that should be front in your book. Like the tagline of your book is like the quote. That's right. That's right. Uh, Jada was very much uh, Jada, sassy, fabulous, uh, uh, adorable, uber talented, energetic. Uh, Tupac was, um, he, he was kind of nerdy. <laughs> um, he was like really, it like really thoughtful and into Shakespeare and, um, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't know him super well. He was a year ahead of me, maybe two, I think maybe just a year. And, um, but uh, it's amazing. yeah, yeah. That's great. I, I just figured, you know, what were they like back then? Um, so, Wendy, I don't have another fun fact for you, but I do have a question. I want you to talk about um, there was a manufacturing company that you worked with. And I want you to talk, uh, tell that story. Okay. So manufacturing doesn't seem as sexy and as exciting as to what Carrie's talking about. <laughs> and they're actually having a hard time pulling the millennials or younger generations into work for them. Um, but manufacturing is a hot spot for technology and finding jobs. And uh, I do a lot of talking about how they can hire non-English speakers to uh, work. And they're good jobs for the people who are very educated but might not have good language skills. So do a lot of talking about that. But I think the manufacturing company that you're talking about in particular is a global manufacturer of like boxes and shipping materials. And they were made up of a bunch of acquisitions and had um, offices in manufacturing plants in different countries. And they offered different products in each of the countries. And they each had their own website. And it was a huge loss for global marketing because they weren't under one brand. They weren't sharing all the you know, the Google juice of having more people come to your website. So very astute marketing person said, okay, we got to get control of this. And she had this massive spreadsheet of countries, products, and what was offered where, and then was able to figure out what had to be translated into different languages. And so we worked real intently with her on making sure this worked. And then they were able to launch a global website that could bring in people from all over the world, but direct them to what products they could buy in the region that they're coming from. So if you're out there looking for a job um, or you know people that don't speak English, don't, don't knock off manufacturing for uh, a career choice because there's huge potential there and huge potential for manufacturers to sell internationally. Yeah. And what's interesting about what both of you do is because you work with different industries, you see trends in these industries. You know, you'll see trends in manufacturing. And so, um, yeah, next thing, uh, Carrie, for you, I want to ask is trends in speaker training. Um, before you answer that, um, you know, I want, Wendy, just for you to touch on mistakes of naming. Okay. You've probably seen some mistakes of people naming products or things that are offensive in a, in a country because people don't realize it's offensive. So I love for to hear a few that are top of mind that you're like, oh my, if they would have just hired us, they would not have had this issue. <laughs> I mean, one I love that you guys are going to get clearly because it was an Iranian company coming into the U.S. with detergent and the detergent's name was Barf. <laughs> <laughs> Or, you know, here's another English one, you know, is uh, Electrolux, you know, the vacuums that are supposed to be good over in uh, England. Their tagline was Electrolux. It sucks. Well, it came into the U.S. and it had a different meaning, so it didn't do well. Um, I think that's a brilliant tagline. <laughs> I think I would totally buy that. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, if you're targeting the right market, right, that's right. Maybe that's it's right. good. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, the Ford Pinto tried to launch in South America. I can't remember which country, but Pinto is a slang term for male genitalia. <laughs> so that didn't work. Luckily, they were able to pluck off the names and put a new one on called Corcel, which was, you know, it meant horse where they were. How so is there's that something that slipped through the cracks at a company. They don't they don't test it. You know, so you can't you've got to look at who you're testing stuff. And if you're you, you go. So if you talk about consumer products, people want to have emotional connection when they buy it. And so it's not as simple as saying, okay, we're going to do this in Spanish and launch it in every, every Spanish speaking country because every place has different slang. Even if you look at New England versus, you know, the West Coast or the slang is very, very different. Um, I, you know, I always like to give the example of y'all, you're wicked smart. You know, those, they just don't go together. Y'all Southern and Wicked is New England. And so you have to think about who your audience is and you want to test it in that audience. So when we've done brand name testing, we don't just ask what language we're, we ask, where are you going to be using this so we can make sure that we have the right people testing, you know, looking at it and telling us, does it have a negative connotation? Do you associate it with anything else? So if you are launching a product in another country, call Wendy. Don't Absolutely. make the mistake of barf. I mean, I don't know how that slips through the cracks. Like, didn't they not ask someone where it was going? You know, well, you know what do you think about this? Yeah, so that's kind of level one. Level two that I'm seeing now is all the e-commerce companies that are missing out on huge amounts because you put something on a website and launch it out there. Um, people are finding it, but if they can't find it in your language, number one, that's a problem. Number two, they're using machine translation to, to uh, run their ads. So in social media, they're wasting their money completely because if that ad doesn't resonate with the people, the culture who you've translated it for, they're going to skip right by it. So if you've got ads that aren't working, um, you've got to really look at what language you're using. And then the other places on Amazon, Amazon's going to show your products all over the world and they're going to put machine translation in. So I can go in there and I can find products that have partial translation and partial English. And the translation's gobbledygook because it was done with machine translation. So you're losing all that ability. And particularly if you're selling on Amazon, they've got such good programs to support exporters so you can actually fulfill it internationally. I think that the cultural, I'm not in this space at all, but I'm going to throw my opinion in. The cultural piece is, is key. And Wendy's company is a, a, a vendor of ours. Rapport International does the translating when we deliver our training in a different language. And so when we started working together, I remember you saying, well, it's not just the translation. It's also the, the cultural piece, how you talk about stuff here in the States maybe very different how we're going to talk about it elsewhere. And, and uh, it's really important to keep in mind. And, right. and Carrie, Thank you. Thank you. And talk about that for a second, because those are mistakes, you know, big mistakes people make with, you know, their product. What are some mistakes people make when presenting? We'll get to the trends and speaker training, but what, what, do, what have you seen? Some crazy stories with presenting and mistakes. And you don't have to name names here, but like, you know, what have you seen? Oh, I've seen some really great mistakes, including some um, very odd wardrobe choices, too. Uh, but you do have to be, if we're talking about cross-cultural audiences, which is something we need to be extremely wary of in the virtual environment, because anybody can log on from anywhere, is to understand is this story going to resonate with all audiences? Is this going to be offensive? Or for me, particularly where I had to start to look at my own content when I'm hired as a speaker is how American centric are my references? There were so many things that I found myself saying like, okay, maybe not everybody in this audience is going to know the Brady Bunch or uh, just let's hit enough. a home run or we're in the fourth quarter. Right. <laughs> yeah. Also, really, or if you say football, I, some people would think right. that's soccer and some okay. people would think uh -huh. it's American football. Yeah, but there's no worries with sports because I never make sports references. But <laughs> yes, exactly. In that in that same vein, I, I 
uh, recall, I, I just, it was a nice reminder to me how closely I need to look at my own stuff. And then we pass that on to our, our, the speakers that we're working with as well. Um, I have seen everything. <laughs> the one, uh, this one guy was, it was at a large tech conference. We had trained him. I was standing in the back watching the session and he, he came out and he told this great opening, engaging story because storytelling is a huge thing and engaged in the audience. And he was like, okay, la la, the end of my story. And now I'm going to basically essentially say, get to my content. And he was like, okay. And he said, I don't, I don't have my clicker. I don't, where is my clicker? He had forgotten to bring on his remote clicker as he kept saying it. And he said, I don't my clicker. I don't my clicker. And <laughs> instead of saying like, Hey, I'm, I'll get started. Can somebody bring me it? He was like, wait, I'll be right back. And he runs off stage and the tech people left his mic on. So all you hear backstage is like, crap. Anyone know where the clicker, where's the, <laughs> like, where's the clicker? Why can't I get the clicker? And so you heard that for, it was probably like a minute, but it was so funny and I'm crying in the back. And then he runs out on stage and he's like, I got it. And the whole audience erupted in, in applause, which was really cool. I, I don't know, he really won them over. I love that. So one is don't leave your mic on if you're going to the bathroom or something, you know, or going back. So, I mean, in that case, it helps, it, it humanizes the person, right? Yes, yes. Well, During except he handled it so well. I mean, to come yes. back on and celebrate, I mean, that makes a huge difference. Yeah, he, he did it. He turned it around. It was, it was, it was really funny, yeah. So, Carrie, <laughs> some trends in speaker training. So, when I, when I started Ovation 10 years ago, it would, it, it would be out of the ordinary if anybody called and asked for anything other than we would like a two-day training please come to our company and do two full days of training. Now, I, we haven't done a two-day training in uh, maybe eight years. And prior to 2020, March 2020, it was like things were getting shorter. Uh, yes, we had a couple full days and then it was like lots of half days. And then in the virtual environment, just because of the way people can take in information, the Zoom, taking into account Zoom fatigue and how much everybody was spending time in front of their devices, we were recommending no more than two hour chunks at a time. I thought that that is what was going to tide over. When we started back doing in-person in the fall, Again, we were getting hired for like one to two hour things in person. I thought this is the way it's going to be. We're going to do lots of series of stuff. No problem. Now I am, I think just in the past couple of weeks, we've had 10 requests for we're getting back together and we want to be back together for a full day. And so that to me is exciting. Love it. We're going to. I was you know, surprised at that. I thought you were going to say that you kept it shorter because I do know that when I've been presenting, it used to go from an hour, then it went to a half an hour. Now, you know, social media is 10 minutes or less than one minute. So it's it's always taking that material and, and cutting it down and down. So that's that's great to hear that you're going back to full day. Yeah, that's definitely on the, the learning and development side yeah. of programs. For speaker development, it is still lots of short little individual sessions, but on the the L and D H R side, it's I'm I am shocked. Sh yeah. uh, delighted and shocked. I guess it's because people want to get together and talk. So you got to build in that time. Uh, and how yes. do you get learning out of that talking? Huh? Yes. Yeah, but you can't you can't teach people by just having them, you know, by doing too short and not repeat on that. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sorry. So, no, you're good, Wendy. I have a question for you, and then I'm going to come back to Carrie. Um, before we hit record, you said Toastmasters on crack, so we're going to talk about that. Oh, yes. In a second, but Thanks. but Wendy, I want you to talk about there's um, a story about Staples. Ah, this goes back to the brand name testing. Yeah, this was really interesting. 
we did Staples tagline um, when they were still more international. It was make more happen. And they wanted to take the more out and put in other words like make work happen, make art happen. Um, and so they asked us to translate it. And what was really interesting is, is you couldn't bookend the words like you could in English and you had to get the message across. So first we had to explain that, like how the message wouldn't make sense if we still tried to bookend it. And then we had one that was make refrigerator art happen. And the French translator came back and she said, refrigerator art what's that? We don't have that in France. And she knew what it was because she lives in the United States. And for those of you who don't know, refrigerator art is that that artwork you're so proud of that your child does that you hang it on the refrigerator. It becomes like your personal art gallery. So we, we went back to Staples and told them, well, there's no refrigerator art in France because the refrigerator is for keeping food cold. It's not a dual purpose. It's not your art gallery and your refrigerator. So they, we gave them an option to come up with something else that would substitute for it, or they just decided to do away with it. You know, coming off that story, you mentioned something earlier about um, the easy button for podcasts that you do at Rise 25. It reminded me of a story um, about a podcast host that was he was in India. I said, he was in India and he said, okay, I speak English. I'm going to do the podcast in English because there's a larger market for it. Couldn't get listenership. He went back to his native language that they smoke, spoke in that region of India, started doing in that and his, his followers skyrocketed. So there's this whole movement to do multilingual podcasts. And if you've got any clients that want to reach an international market, you can take the recorded podcast, translate it, have a voiceover in, and then they've just expanded that content of, of what to do beyond. So I love there's that. all sorts That's of awesome. uncreative stuff going on. Yeah. Thanks for that idea. That's great. Sure. Um, Toastmasters on crack. <laughs> That's right. So I, the pandemic hits. I cried in the corner for like 20, 20 minutes. It wasn't much. And I'm like, all right, wh what am I going to do? How am I going to keep my trainers, which are all professional actors when everything's shut down, busy? Oh, I'm not traveling. We're not supporting 100 in-person events because there are no in-person events. Uh, what can I do? And I thought, I, I want to build like, you know, a, a I, I want to I want to build a modern day Toastmasters on crack. And I did. So I created a B2C platform with, so anybody can come in, get speaker training. It's a monthly membership. It's called Studio G. You can find it at getstudioG.com. And uh, which Studio G, by the way, was the original, original, original company, company name I had for this company when I was first like tooling around with the idea 110 years ago. And it is a monthly membership. We've got different levels. There's live weekly, everything's virtual. It's live weekly workshops. You can add on additional one-on-one -on -one coaching. We have rotating training videos, and you also have access to our exclusive AI-driven rehearsal platform. So you're able to go on Rehearse your presentations, it pumps out metrics like faster talking or how many filler words you're using. And it's an asynchronous coaching tool. So you upload it. Wendy's mouth is open and that's cool. It means I've impressed her. So oh, man, the, I can't believe I didn't know about this. So, so I am so yes. excited. So I, I, you know, my unofficial tagline, because I don't think I could really use it because I might get sued, is, you know, we're Toastmasters on crack. <laughs> so we, uh, but you know, so any marketers out there who want, I, I would love to find a way to like, you know, roast toast without. Who do you think's ideal? Who's ideal for that? You think? Is it so? It is. It, it is. Um, it absolutely could be entrepreneurs. It was. I, I thought of it more as somebody who's on the precipice of a promotion or people looking to make a move in their career, and they just wanted to refine their professional presence a little bit before going on an interview or maybe stepping up within an organization. Or they've got a presentation. They're speaking at a conference. They're nervous. Come on in practice, get out, but also stay. 
So getstudioG.com. That's right. Thank you. You know, yes. another huge target market is English bilingual speakers or people internationally. The U.S. has a yes. lot of people that aren't afraid of standing up and speaking, but there's a lot of people that move from technology, you know, positions or operational into management and they have no skills. So have you thought about doing this in other languages too? I would love to. And we have a couple bilingual folks on my team right now. I'm always looking to grow that. Fantastic. I All right. It. I'm going to check it out because if Thanks I hear for sharing people, that, Carrie. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for giving me the, the space to do so. Yeah. I appreciate it. Um, so I also just want to end. I, I don't want to forget to have you talk uh, for a second about VMware. Oh, man. Yes, VMware is one of our uh, one of our clients that we support their big show and their big conference last year was called VM World. I encourage the universe to see what may be coming down the pike of which I'm not allowed to say. Uh, but it was a, it was a shining moment for us because uh, VMware had shared with me that for the past five years, they've always used a new speaker training company. And we supported their speakers last year. And for the first time in five years, they said, wait a minute, these guys are a little different. We're going to stick with them. So we're their first repeat vendor in terms of speaker training in five years. Something I'm really proud of really goes to the, the quality and the work ethic of of the ovation trainers. And uh, it was, it's a proud moment for me. So thank you for letting me share that. Yeah. And then Kill Carey reminds me, I do have to introduce you and a shout out to Eventique that they do events all over the country. I think in different countries, even, you know, in New York and, and you guys, there's a, I see a lot of collaboration there between the two of your companies because they basically help put on these shows all over the place. Yes. So I'll have to shout out to Eventique and we'll, you'll have to meet Carrie and, and her company too. So thank you both for sharing your amazing stories. And I just want to point people to both your websites. Um, you can go to getovation.com or as Carrie mentioned, getstudioG.com. And then um, as far as uh, Wendy goes, you can go to rapport, that's R-A-P-P-O-R-T, translations.com. Are there any other places online for either of you that we should have people check out? LinkedIn. Okay. I'm all over LinkedIn. Wendy so Wendy Pease, P-E-A-S-E, -E, like peas and carrots with an E at the end. Um, and I'm posting funny, if you like the funny stories about translation, we're posting stuff like that all the time when we come across it. If you have any, send them over to me too. <laughs> yes, I'm on the LinkedIn as well. Are we allowed to mention our podcast? Of course, go ahead. Oh, yes. So my podcast is called Speaking of Events. So that'll be a great intro to the event company that you talked to. I'd love to speak with them. And Wendy, you have a podcast too, right? I do, The Global Marketing Show. So on all the places you find podcasts. Well, thank you both. This has been fantastic. And thanks everyone for listening. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Rising Entrepreneurs Podcast. This episode is powered by Rise 25. Please subscribe and check out future episodes.